Hello, me again, and today we're still on circular motion, and the circles are still horizontal flat circles, so we're still not changing our sort of our altitude, if you like, so we're still not doing loop de loops. Um, but this time we're in 3D, so there is going to be sort of um, angles and ropes and things holding us, like you can see in the two carousels in the diagrams there. All right. Now, I guess it's common sense that if you're on one of those carousels, the faster it turns, the sort of the more your chair lifts out. If you look at this one over here, look. When the when the rider's at rest, they hang vertically down, but then as it speeds up, they get lifted out. And if they went really fast, they'd get out to like almost 90 degrees, not quite, but almost 90 degrees until eventually I guess the rope would snap because the tension would be too much to keep them going in a circle. Okay, remember F equals M R omega squared and if you try to go omega too quickly you'll end up breaking your F, which is your, your force in the string. Okay, so a couple of things to remind you of then. Omega is the angular velocity, so how quickly you're turning in terms of radians. V in any equations that I use is your tangential speed so that's like your straight line speed at that point in time even though you're going in a, a circle it's still sort of your straight line speed when you're working in radians 2 pi is one full turn and if you wanted to work out how long it takes to do a full turn then 2 pi divided by omega would do that okay so if your omega was 4 pi in other words you're going around twice Per second, 4 pi is twice around, isn't it? 2 pi divided by 4 pi is 0 0.5, so logically it takes half a second to do one turn. All right, so that might come in handy in some questions if you've got to calculate how long it takes to do one full turn. Okay, so first thing I want you to draw then is a, a side on 3D view, if you like, of one of those little carousel swings. So you've got a particle of mass m on a string of length L and we measure the angle in these problems from the string to the vertical so at the top where they are attached okay and it's called alpha typically in these rather than theta we use alpha and really on this one all you need to see is that the radius of the circle now depends on L and alpha and because there's a right angle triangle here where L is the hypotenuse and L sine theta is the opposite. That's why we're using sine rather than cos. So the radius, the radius depends on the length of the rope and the angle. Okay, and as we discussed a minute ago, then the faster you go, the bigger the angle gets, the bigger the radius gets. Okay, so that's going to come in handy because we can substitute that in where we used to have lowercase r for radius. In our formulas. More importantly though is the same thing but this time I'm, I'm not drawing the length so I'm not interested in the length of the rope and the radius this is this diagram is more about the forces. So the rope has got tension a pulling force okay along its length and of course it's it's pulling up towards the highest point where it's attached to like the crane or whatever Okay, but we're not really interested in a force acting at an angle. What we're interested in is vertical and horizontal, because in this case, the horizontal force is the one towards the centre, and that's the force that we use when we're using our formulas. So when we're saying that F equals m r omega squared, it's the force towards the centre. So it's the horizontal component here, right? So using Z angles then, so down here, up, and then back down, you can see that if you've got an angle of alpha at the top there, then this is also angle alpha. And so I can break down this force into its component pieces. So T is the tension, and that's the hypotenuse in this little right angle triangle. This is the opposite at the top. So this is T sine alpha. Okay, the horizontal force and this is T cos alpha. Now 
what you've got to consider here is that that rope, that string, the tension is to it doing two jobs. It's pulling the mass towards the center and therefore giving acceleration so it can go around in a circle. That's the T sine alpha bit of the force. The T cos alpha is keeping us in equilibrium and stopping the particle from dropping down. Obviously, if the particle's got mass, it has weight, mg. All right. Now, if we're saying that the height of this particle is not changing because the path it's following is a horizontal circle, it's not going up or down, it's just going round and round at the same height, then T cos alpha must be equal to mg. So that's always going to be the case. If it's in equilibrium and, and transcribing a horizontal circle, T cos alpha, the upwards component of T, is going to be equal to mg. And you will often know the mass. So that will help you to find out either T or alpha, depending on what's missing. But also, from what we've got up there, we can take this formula, so if I do a bit of moving around, we can take this formula which we were using last lesson. So F equals MR omega squared, and we can substitute in expressions from our diagrams up here. So remember, this F is the F, the force towards the center of the circle, which is T sine alpha at the top there, look, acting in towards the center of the circle. Now that equals m times r, and remember this is the radius, l sine alpha, so l sine alpha, and then we've got our omega squared on the end. And because we've got sine alpha on both sides, you can cancel that out, and what you get left with, which saves us a bit of time actually, is that t, the tension in the rope, is equal to m l omega squared. So if you know, if you know the three of these out of tension, mass, length of the string, and angular velocity, you can find any of the others. You need to know three, obviously, because there's four variables there. So that's quite a handy result. You're not given that one in the formula book, but it's quite quick to prove if you're starting from scratch. Okay, just draw out these diagrams, label it with signs and causes, and dump them into F equals MR omega squared. Right, so what sort of questions do you get for this topic then? So we've got a mass of four kilograms. So pause the video, by the way, because you're going to need to draw this. A mass of four kilograms is on a string of length one meter. So if I start listing variables here, so M is four and L is one. When the mass is spinning in a horizontal circle, or in horizontal circles, the angle between the string and the vertical is 35 degrees. So we've got 35 degrees up there. Okay. Calculate the tension in the string and the tangential speed. So that's V. So we're finding T and V for this diagram. All right. So let's start labeling what we've got. So obviously we've got some mg acting downwards. Uh, the mass is 4, so 4 times 9.8 for mg is 39.2. 39.2 newtons of weight. We have got a radius across here which is going to be, because this, remember this is of length 1, this is just going to be 1 sine 35, or just sine 35 really then, isn't it? Okay. Then we've got the tension from the rope, and we don't know what the tension is, but we can certainly give it an expression. So here's our T, and then we can put it into its horizontal and vertical components. So remember that's going to be 35 degrees because of the z angle we've created. So this is t cos 35 degrees and this is t sine 35 degrees. And all you've got to do then 
is resolve vertically and resolve horizontally and it's going to be easier to resolve vertically because there's less going on all right we've got one force down which is the weight and we've got one force up which is t cos 35 so let's start there then so if we label this part of our workings vertically and we can say that t cos 35 is equal to 39.2 which is going to let us work out what t is so 39.2 divided by cos 35 t is 47 and i'll keep this accurate i'll leave it on my calculator screen but i'll write it down quite because we've got quite a bit of work to do 47.854 Okay, now we're nowhere near finishing, so try and leave that on your screen if you can while we do the next bit. So, found the tension of string. Now find the tangential speed of the particle. So, this is now working in the circular part of, of the problem. So, horizontally now then. So, there's only one force towards the centre. So, remember, we're starting with either... I mean, you can start with that if you want to, or as I proved on the previous slide, we can start with ML omega squared. Okay. In fact, I don't want to use that one because it hasn't got V in. So let's go back. That would be okay if we were finding omega. In fact, yeah, go on, we'll use that one and we'll convert it into V at the end. So F equals ML omega squared we could have done something with mv squared over r but i think i'll use this one and just convert it at the end it doesn't make much difference so um t then now we know t because we just worked it out so 47.854 that number on the calculator equals 4 times 1 times omega squared so to find omega squared, I need to do 47.854, whatever that number is, divided by 4. So this is why I left it on the screen. So omega squared is 11.96. And then square root that omega is 3.46. Okay. Radians per second. Okay, now I can convert that from omega to uh, tangential speed. Okay, so V equals omega R. That's from your notes last week, if you're wondering where I've just pulled that from. So it's going to be that 3.46 number, or 3.458 really, times sine 35. So try and leave stuff on your calculator screen. So I've got 1.98 meters per second as the actual sort of traveling speed of that particle at that angle okay if i wanted the angle to increase the speed would have to increase as well okay so what happens is as you increase this angle as you increase this 35 degrees this 35 obviously increases as well and what that does is it makes t sine 35 get bigger okay so and as t sine 35 is getting bigger, so the, the force towards the centre of the circle, this is getting bigger, isn't it? Okay, and m and l are fixed, so omega has to increase. So as f increases, so does omega, not linearly, because there's a squared involved. Okay, but that's why an increased angle is linked to an increase in angular velocity and tangential speed. Okay, let's have a look at another one then, with some different variables this time. This time we've got a mass of 2 kilograms, so m is 2, and we've got a length of 0 0.8, and we've kind of got omega in a weird sort of way. We know that it completes 3 revolutions per second, so 3 full turns. So how many radians is that? 6 pi. Remember, one full turn is 2 pi. Calculate the angle of the string. Now, careful, don't go on to this bit yet. That's the second part, so we'll come to that later. So this time we're calculating the angle. All right, okay, so let's add some 
stuff to our diagram. So we've got a length of 0 0.8, an angle of just alpha. So this is 0 0.8 sine alpha for our radius. 0.8 sine alpha. We've got a tension force T. So let's add that one. And put that in blue so it matches up with the same as last time. And if I break that up then, so this is alpha for the unknown. This is T cos alpha and this is T sine alpha. Okay, and then the one force I haven't got on you so far is the weight. So 2 times 9.8, 19.6 newtons there. Okay, so let's move this over so I've got a bit of room to do some work. Okay, where do we start? Well, working vertically, because there's not too much going on there, we can say that T cos alpha is equal to 19.6 which is not very helpful because we don't know t and we don't know what alpha is okay so let's go on to horizontally then and see what we can do there so f well t i suppose if we're using the the shortened version so t equals m l omega squared now I've got M, I've got L, I've got Omega, so I should be able to find T, and then I can find Alpha after that. So T equals 2 times 0 0.8 times 6 pi squared. 2 times 0 0.8 times 6 pi, okay, if I type this in. Squared. Now I've got T as 568. Okay, so let's put that in. So T equals 568. And again, leave this on a calculator if you can. So 489 dot 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 dot. We can put that back in now, look. Alright, so if I rearrange, bring that down. Rearrange it slightly, so what we'll get is that cos alpha equals 19.6 over t. Okay, so 19.6 divided by your answer comes out really tiny, but that's because we're going to do cos minus 1 in a minute, so 0 0.034 dot 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 dot, and then do cos minus 1 of that, and we get 88.02 degrees. Okay, so what we're saying is, I mean, actually what this would look like is something like that would be more accurate because we're measuring from the vertical. So 88.02 degrees. So it's almost horizontal, in fact, because the particle is traveling around so quickly, the string is lifted up to increase T sine alpha enough to keep the velocity up high. Okay. Then the second part of the question says if the speed is increased to six revolutions per second. So six revolutions is 12 pi. So actually the only thing I've got to change then is this line here. And then obviously I substitute it back in differently. So if we say that six revs per second is 12 pi rads per second, and then recalculate again. So t equals 2 times 0 0.8, this time times 12 pi squared. So 2 times 0 0.8 times 12 pi squared. You get absolutely ginormous force required to keep it going in a circle. 956 dot 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 dot. Again, we can substitute into the same equation. So cos alpha equals 19.6 over t. Remember, that's coming from the vertical expression we had up here. So 19.6 divided by that 2000 number comes out in standard form is 0.0008619, something like that. 
and cos minus 1 of that, so just working through the same way I did last time, comes out as 89.51. So hardly different when we double the rotation or the angular velocity. And that's because the angle can never get to actually 90 degrees. Okay, if we got to 90 degrees, T cos alpha, the vertical part of that force, would go to zero. And it can't go to zero because it always needs to be in equilibrium with that 19.6 newtons. So even if you spin in it as fast as you possibly can, you'll never ever truly get to 90 degrees. And what happens is actually, as you get closer to 90 degrees, T sine alpha gets absolutely massive, T goes absolutely massive, and you're more likely to snap your string or your rod, whatever you're using, before you get that close to 90. Okay. It doesn't actually take much to lift it up the first few degrees, but as you get closer to 90, it gets harder to lift that last little extra bit. Okay. So that's what we call like a conical pendulum is the posh name, all right? When you're suspended on a string but still traveling in a horizontal circle, I mean, you can do the experiments like this in the house easily. And I challenge you now, when you go to Cardiff at Christmas and you see a ride like this, not to be thinking about uh, the physics of it, the maths of it, if you like. You could even, if you measured the angle and, and measured the angle of velocity, you could even calculate the mass of the riders, if you're that bored. Okay, not saying you have to do it, but you could. Okay, then the next thing we need to look at, because this is still things going round in a horizontal circle, is a sort of sports that involve banked curves. Okay, I've got a couple of examples there. So you've got NASCAR racing, where the, the track is curved, well, it's curved on the straights and the corners. It doesn't need to be curved on the straights, but they do it anyway because it makes it easier to build. Okay. You've got bobsleigh which is from the Winter Olympics, which if it wasn't curved wouldn't exist as a sport because there's very little friction on the ice, so you just slide off sideways as soon as you got to the first corner. Okay, and they're banked almost to vertical as you can see in that picture in the top right. And then you've got a velodrome for the cycling. All right, now that's a very extreme one there. Typically a velodrome track is, is angled at about 45 degrees. But all of these sports have a bank for the same reason. By having a banked curve, you can increase the forces towards the centre of the curve. And if you increase the forces, you can increase the, the velocity of going round the bend. Okay? Without the banked curve, the only thing keeping you on the track and sliding off sideways would be friction. And the friction is never going to be enough to get the sort of speeds that they want to do. Okay? If you think as you go round the roundabout in the car, you get sort of thrown to the outside of the car, don't you? Okay. So the banking reduces the need for friction. So you don't need so much slip and slide force going on and friction to prevent it. And it increases the force towards the centre. But how does that happen? Well, if you'd done uh, the full A level first, you'd be a bit more familiar with this. So kind of getting ahead of ourselves here, but you need to know it. So there's Lightning McQueen, as you know, he's a very fast race car, not as fast as Jackson Storm, but still very fast. Okay, and Lightning is on a, a banked corner, and we're again we'll call it Alpha. This time though, we'll measure from the horizontal. Okay, now Lightning McQueen has mass, and therefore Lightning McQueen has weight, same as everything else. So mg. So why doesn't Lightning McQueen fall through the floor? It's because of his normal contact force. But the normal contact force doesn't act upwards because weight acts downwards. That isn't how it works. Normal contact force depends on the angle of the surface and it's always perpendicular. So the road pushes back at 90 degrees. Now, this is going to be similar to what we just had with a string at an angle. Okay. And just like when we had the string, whereas we've got angled force there and we're not interested in the angle, what we're interested in is the horizontal and vertical components of that force. Okay. 
So the row pushes back, we call it normal contact force, which is capital R, and they've got to be careful because obviously we have a little R for radius. Radius would be from this point to the middle of the curve. So sort of if you looked at a bird's eye view and you've got a race track like that, little r is the distance to the car's position from the center of the curve there, whereas big R is our contact force. On this diagram, and you can figure it out if you really want, but that's alpha, you can trust me, that's probably the easiest thing, okay? Because as this gets smaller, so does that. So they're the same angle, which gives us bit like last time where we had t cos and psi now we've got r so r cos alpha and r sine alpha so cos alpha is stopping like the mcqueen from falling through the floor to the center of the planet so handy r sine alpha is the force towards the center of the track and that's the force that helps him to go quickly around the corners Remember, the bigger your force towards the center, the bigger your angular velocity, and therefore the bigger your tangential velocity. Now, in reality, what you'd also have here, but we're not going to get into it in this video, is you could possibly have friction acting upwards to stop him from sliding down the track if he wasn't going quick enough. Okay. Or, if he was going really quickly, there would be friction acting down the track to stop him sliding up and into the crowd. So there would be friction as well. But in these questions, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of work with the exact velocity that there is no friction required to help us out. So there's a basic diagram of an object on a banked sort of incline going round a curve. All right. And the only thing stopping Lightning McQueen from flying off into the crowd is R sine alpha. Okay. So the bigger you get for alpha, the bigger R sine alpha is. Okay. So if we have a look at a question then. So Lightning McQueen is 1.8 tons. So M is 1,800 kilograms. The angle is 35 degrees. Okay. V is 40 meters per second. Okay, so we're going to work with mv squared over r. And we're missing the radius. So we're going to find the radius of the curve, so little r. Right, let's put in some forces then. So we've got Lightning McQueen's weight. So 1,800 times 9.8 He's got a weight of 17640 newtons. The track pushing back, perpendicular of course, and then we've got the components of that force. So here's our, there's our 35 degrees. This is our cos 35. And this is our sine 35. And we want to calculate the radius of the curve. So r equals question mark. Now, f equals mv squared over r. That's a formula from last week. Okay. Where f is the horizontal force, which in this case is going to be r sine 35. Little r is the radius of the bend, which is what we're trying to work out, and we've got m and v. So if I can work out what r sine 35 is, I can put it in there, and I can work out little r, the radius of the curve. So how do we find out what r sine 35 is? Well, we can do it by resolving vertically first. Because in the vertical direction, there's only two forces, and they're equal. r cos... 35 is equal to the weight of Lightning McQueen. So if you do 17640 divided by cos 35, we get that R is 21534 
0.46 and I'll leave that on the calculator screen Newtons. Now that means I can work out what r sine 35 is because r sine 35, so this is working horizontally now, r sine 35 is equal to 1800 times 40 squared over little r. Now then r sine 35, this is why I leave it on the calculator, so answer times sine 35 R sine 35 is 12351.66 equals all of that stuff on the right. And then to rearrange that, then if you swap little r and the uh, 12351 number, so make a fraction, and so one, uh, 1800, nearly put in 18,000 then, times 40 squared divided by answer. I get that the radius of the curve is 233.17 meters. So to see that then, so on, this is like an oval racetrack, what we've just worked out, looking from above, is that that is 233 meters. Okay, all the way around obviously it sweeps a semicircle. And if that's the case, all of these forces work out nicely and we don't need any friction to help keep us on the track. From sliding up or sliding down. Okay. And we can do one more of those then. So this time it's the cyclist. Now cycling tracks are made of wood so they've got very little friction. If you watch the, uh, the Summer Olympics and watch the cycling you'll see they quite often end up slipping sideways off the track and so it's really important they get the banking right to match the speeds they do. So this time we've got a cyclist of mass 90 kilograms. So let's put his weight in 882. And that includes the bike as well. So we've got a radius of 24 meters. We've got a tangential speed of 18 meters per second. And this time we're going to calculate the angle of the track. So alpha alpha there as well. Here's our reaction force. So this is our cos alpha and this is our sine alpha. If you want to have a go at yourselves before I do, feel free. So let's have a look vertically first. If we do vertically and horizontally and we'll see where that leaves us then. So vertically, what do we know? Well, we know that R cos alpha has got to be equal to 882 newtons but r and alpha are both unknowns so on its own that doesn't help us but horizontally remember we've got our formula f equals mv squared over r that's given to you in the formula book you haven't got to memorize that one f equals mv squared over r and we've got m, which I should have put a view really with all my other values. We've got m, we've got v, and we've got little r. Okay, so f equals 90 times 18 squared, all divided by 24. So 90 times 18 squared, I work these out as I go along, which is a bit risky in case I muck it up. So F equals 1, 2, 1, 5. Now remember, F is the horizontal force. So that's R sine alpha. So R sine alpha is 1,215. And what we've got now is two equations with the same two unknowns, so simultaneous equations. I think I'm going to solve it by rearranging one and substituting into the other. So it doesn't matter which way around you do this, but if I write R as 882 divided by cos alpha and sub it into there, then what I get is 882 over cos alpha times sine alpha 
is 1215. So I can tidy that a bit. This has 882 sine alpha on the top over cos alpha on the bottom. And the important little maths trick that you're going to need to know here is quite handy, not just in mechanics, but handy all over the place, is that sine alpha over cos alpha is tan alpha. So sine alpha over cos alpha is equal to tan alpha. So any time you can get sine over cos, that's a good thing because you can reduce that just to tan. So 882 tan alpha is 1215 and it's an easy rearrangement from you then. So 1215 divided by 882 gives you 1.37 and then tan minus 1 is 54 degrees. So to keep the cyclist on the track with no friction at all at that speed would need an angled track of 54 degrees. Okay, so if the track wasn't 54 degrees and he still wanted to go that speed, he's going to need some help from friction. Now it may not be possible because friction is not uh, unlimited and we'll get into friction uh, probably when I'm in front of you, hopefully soon. So if the track wasn't steep enough, Okay, so a bit flatter. The friction would need to act towards the center. Okay, to stop him flying off the edges. If the track was too steep, then he's not going fast enough to stay up on the track, and so we would need the friction acting up the slope to stop him sort of sliding down towards the center. The thing with track cycling is, unless you're going really, really fast, you can't cycle around the track. So for us regular, normal people, if we tried to cycle around there and we weren't going quick enough, we would just either slide or roll down the track. It only works if you're going fast enough because there's so little friction available. It's a bit different for um, cars racing on tarmac because rubber tires on tarmac, there's a huge amount of friction available, but thin bike wheels on, on a polished wooden surface, there isn't much friction available. And so they've got to get that track angle right for the typical speed of a typical um, racing cyclist. Okay. Uh, it also depends on the radius of the track. So smaller tracks have steeper sides, which makes them harder to cycle on, because if you slow down, you fall off. Okay. And then with the bobsleigh, of course, because that's on ice with basically zero friction, and they're traveling at speeds of 80, 90, 100 miles an hour, the track has to be banked almost vertically for them to keep up that speed. Okay. Even then, it can go wrong. If they go into a corner too quickly, and they do have brakes on, if they go in too quickly, all that will happen is they'll ride right up the sides and in some cases come out of the track, which is pretty grisly. We won't get into that. So there's an introduction to sort of 3D strings at angles and surfaces at angles to keep you going round a horizontal circle.